You may be around the world and thank you for your company on truth to you.org. That's truth number two letter you.org. Joining me this hour is one of the world's foremost authorities on missionaries, cults, and the Jewish community. He is the Director of Education and Counseling for Jews for Judaism in Canada. The website is JewsforJudaism.ca. JewsforJudaism.ca. Welcome back to the program, Rabbi Michael Skobak. So great to be here with you, Chano. Wonderful to have you back on the program, my friend. We've had uh, very positive uh, responses to the series that you and I are doing. Of course, uh, we're working our way through a list. In fact, you may want to recap. What did we do last week? We almost finished the book of Genesis. We got all the way up to... uh I think it was a passage in Genesis 28, Mm -hmm. I believe was the last one we did. So we covered about 15 passages in the book of Genesis that uh, many Christian apologists uh, argue are part of their brief, part of their case uh, that proves that Jesus was the Messiah. And they're basically, they're trotting out these pieces of evidence. So we've had about 15 pieces of evidence to have considered mm-hmm. and uh, so we're almost finished the book of Genesis but just wanted to summarize for, for those that are listening uh, what we discovered last week what we discovered basically was two things number one that literally none of the passages uh, that we looked at last week were passages that were really about the Messiah meaning that if we read those passages in context uh, no one in the planet would really think that they're about the Messiah, and specifically, no one living before Christianity would have imagined that any of those passages were there to help us know who the Messiah will be. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, that's the Christian assertion, is that these are pieces of evidence that are helping us identify the Messiah, but the truth is that none of those passages, uh, if one were to read the Bible before Christianity, no one would have imagined that any of those passages were descriptive of the Messiah. Um, What Christian apologists have done, though, is they seized upon those passages and they read them out of context, out of their original context, and basically transformed them into messianic prophecies because they resonate with Jesus, meaning that that once the, the Christian begins with their assertion that Jesus was the Messiah, um, this is, as we said, from Alice in Wonderland to first have the verdict and then the trial. So if we've mm-hmm. already established that Jesus was the Messiah, so then anything in the Jewish Bible that sounds like Jesus then becomes, it becomes elevated into a messianic prophecy. So the first thing we saw last week was that none of these passages are about the Messiah, but Christian apologists basically transform them into messianic prophecies simply because they resonate in some way with Jesus. And the second problem we saw was that even if one were to make the mistake and think that these were passages that really are speaking about the Messiah, the problem is that they don't specifically identify Jesus, Um, meaning that they are basically making an assertion that this passage which they claim is about the Messiah, they're asserting that it's talking about Jesus. But again, Mm -hmm. there's no proof. For example, uh, let's say there was a passage in the Bible, and the passage says, he will be wise. Now, there's no reason to assume that that phrase is referring to the Messiah. But Mm -hmm. Christians may say, oh, that's a messianic prophecy. So they've taken a passage which is not necessarily about the Messiah. It just says that someone is going to be wise, and they make it into a messianic prophecy, And then they make the second error of saying, and it has to be speaking about Jesus. But again, there's no proof that that passage, even if we do assume for some reason that it's describing the Messiah, that he'll be wise, there's no proof that it's speaking about Jesus. There are many wise people in history, and there will be many wise people. So basically, these are two constant themes that we saw over and over and over again last week, and we're going to continue to see this pattern uh, reappearing this week and in future weeks that basically through this uh, really thinking error, it's, it's really a, an error in logic of uh, circular reasoning which leads uh, to the out of context quotation in the Bible, this will be the pattern that repeats itself over and over and over again. This is, this is what you expect to see and, and so what you're saying is that you didn't go to church on Sunday and currently what, what you and I are doing, is what we've embarked upon, what you've just been talking about we are going through a list. Uh, anyone can find these lists online. 
Uh, we're going through a list of uh, the supposed 365 prophecies of Jesus uh, that uh, in, in the Tanakh that he supposedly fulfilled. You know, we were joking last week about whether anyone that would be exposed to this evidence would be going to church this week. I think that if I was sitting in a courtroom listening to just, the, let's say, the first 30 pieces of evidence here, mm -hmm. um, I would have been so turned off already to the prospect of this enterprise producing any fruit. I mean, that uh, the, the nature of these proofs have been so not compelling that I don't think I would really have uh, subjected myself. Them? Yeah, I mean, who's yeah. going to want to go through? I mean, if the first 30 have, have none that are compelling and that they seem just so tenuous and so, uh, you know, the, the connection to reality is so hard to even uh, find it. It's hard, it's hard to even understand what they're trying to say in so many cases. Yeah. Uh, I, would, that's, uh, yeah I would say... Yeah, you want, want, want to get out of that courtroom pretty quick. But, <laughs> but, but the thing is, though, the, the one that we're kicking out, last week we went from, uh, on this particular list, we went from number 1 to number 14. We're now kicking off from 15. In fact, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 proofs that uh, of, of messianic prophecies that Jesus supposedly fulfilled all come from the same verse. Surely there's got to be at least one compelling uh, piece of evidence in there, and this is where we're starting from. It's Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Five, five, surely one of these. Okay, so the first one, it says, uh, number 15 from Genesis 49, 10, it says, the time of his coming. Now, what they've referenced here is Luke 2, uh, verses 1 to 7, which is just the, the birth narrative uh, uh, in, in Luke. Uh, Galatians 4.4, 4, which says that, uh, says that Jesus... I mean, they're basically saying that he was born, right? I mean, is that, is that what they're saying? Well, I, I think that uh, Jesus probably was born. Uh, I think he probably was. I think, yeah. Yeah, and... Well, there you go! He's the Messiah! Don't you see? You're going to church on Sunday. Well, it's interesting, though, because even from a Christian point of view, when does he become the Messiah? You know, did they assert that he became the Messiah at his birth? Or was it something that took place, you know, decades later? Um, you know, this is a very interesting passage in Genesis 49, because it's one of the few passages in this entire list of 365 passages where Judaism would actually concur and say that, you know, this probably is speaking of half the Messiah. That's the unusual nature of this one. And, and even so, as we'll see, you know, as we go through this, it's far from clear. Um, now, when it says here the time of his coming, uh, this is very, very difficult. I mean, it's hard to understand what exactly uh, uh, are they trying to say here in terms of this passage in Genesis. This is what I was going to say, because I can't, I can't see in verse 10. And let me just read it for the people. In fact, I'll, um, uh, this is the blessing given to Judah. And it starts from verse 8. It says, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. As a lion, who shall rouse him? Verse 10, and this is it. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, we'll get to that, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, I don't see anything here about the time of his coming, as, as this list references in um, evidence piece number 15. Yeah, I don't know where they get that from. I, I think that, as we'll see, it's really a, 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 an unfortunate misunderstanding. I think what often uh, Christian apologists have said is that they understand this passage to be saying that once the Messiah comes, uh, it'll be at a time when the rulership, um, you know, has departed at, from the Jewish people, meaning in a time when, the, when there's no more Jew, Jewish king, that'll be the time when the Messiah will come. Um, and they say that, you know, at the time of Jesus, there was no Jewish king, and so that points to the coming of the timing of the Messiah coming. The problem in terms of timing is that there really had not been a Jewish king for over about 600 years already. Um, th the last Jewish king was Zedekiah, uh, Zedekiah, mm -hmm. about 586 BCE. Mm. So if this passage is uh, telling us when the Messiah is to come, uh, it certainly wouldn't be pointing to Jesus. It would be pointing to someone who already came 600 years before. 
Um, but the truth is that it's not saying uh, this at all. Um, and it's not an easy verse to understand. First of all, we'll have to understand what does it mean when it speaks about Shiloh or Shiloh. Um, hmm. it's, traditionally, Jews and Christians both take that as a reference to the Messiah, although I would say, again, it's far from clear. But if we do take that as the assumption, um, what the verse is basically saying in this promise to Judah, and again, we have to remember that this passage, the context is, it's the blessings that Jacob is giving to his children, and now he's blessing Judah, and he's basically mm -hmm. saying that the right to kingship, the right to rulership, will always remain within the tribe of Judah. Um, that's what he's saying here, that the, the scepter will not depart from Judah. So that's the mm -hmm. promise, that any king uh, of the Jewish people, by right, really should be coming from Judah. And uh, that's all it's saying, really. That's the promise that Judah is, is be being given. Now, the, the tricky phrase is when it says, um, it will not depart from until Shiloh comes. Now, the English seems to imply that once Shiloh comes, then the rulership will depart, which is really not what it means at all. What it, it is saying is that, not that there will always be an actual king from the tribe of Judah. It's not telling us in this passage that there will always be ruling on the throne a king from the tribe of Judah. It's saying that there will always be a rightful heir. There will always be someone who could be ruling, but we know for mm -hmm. many years in Jewish history, uh, we were dominated by foreign cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, even uh, for a short period of time, when we came back from uh, the exile from Babylon, there was a hundred or so years when the Hashmonoyim were ruling, but they were from the tribe of Levi. They were priests. Um, so even when there wasn't an actual king from the line of Judah, but we Judah had the right and, and had really the, the promise by God that if there would be a king, it was going to be from his lineage. Mm -hmm. And when it says that it, it will not depart until Shiloh comes, what it means is that throughout Jewish history, there'll be the right to kingship will be to, given to the tribe of Judah. They will always have the, um, the, the promise of yep. the right of rulership. And when Shiloh comes, it will not be uh, potential, it will be actualized. Meaning, when the Messiah comes, then there will actually be a king from the line of Judah on the throne forevermore. And if, if I was just going to say, I was going to say, if we had to, and, and I'm thinking of uh, Second Samuel chapter 7, we may get there, but uh, the, the word Shiloh, do we know what the definition of that word is? Can we be specific? Yes, yeah, so many uh, possible ways of reading it. I mean, I was thinking mm -hmm. earlier on, uh, Rabbi Arya Kaplan has a translation called the uh, Living Torah, and he offers, uh, I think, at least a half a dozen ways of reading it. We know, for example, Shiloh was a place name. It was a, one of the places mm -hmm. where the tabernacle was came to rest. I've been came. there. Yeah. Um, it, what it might mean in terms of the uh, etymology of the word um, it could mean to him, it could be speaking about a gift, a shy in Hebrew is a gift, his gift um, to him. I mean, it's very elusive what the actual word means. Um, and and it's not clear at all. And I think that... It's, it's, it interesting, it's interesting you should say that, because in this particular list that we're looking at, and this happens to be number 17, um, they say that Shiloh means sent one, and of course they cite John... 17 verse 3 where I think uh, Jesus is praying for his disciples and he mentions that he is sent by God therefore he must be Shiloh according to this list and that's a fulfilled uh, messianic prophecy but in my New King James study Bible which I have in front of me it says Shiloh is an obscure word which is what you pretty much just said probably meaning uh, the one to whom it belongs now that's that's a definition that they've pinned to it and they go on to say that is uh, until the one to whom all royalty uh, royal authority belongs comes, the tribe of Judah will always have a lawgiver in its ranks. Now, I think that concurs with what you've been saying. It then goes on to say, uh, even though they've just said that Shiloh is an obscure word, we're not entirely sure what it means. It probably means this is what they've said. Then they go on to say, to say an absolute statement, Shiloh, like seed, and seed we, we did speak about in the last program, Shiloh, like seed, is a name for the coming Messiah. Now, they're pretty, pretty certain about that. 
Yeah, but that seems to concur with what you're saying as well, right? Well, that, that's how Jews have have historically understood this verse. Mm -hmm. That it is referring, Shiloh does refer to Messiah. But again, I would say, far from clear. And, you know, if I was trying to find passages in the Hebrew scriptures that clearly point to the Messiah, uh, uh, this would not be one of them. And, mm -hmm. and the truth is that it wouldn't really be that helpful in any way. I mean, it, it basically... Um, doesn't tell us much about the Messiah. Um, it just basically says that uh, the rulership will remain in effect, enforced, uh, when the, the Messiah comes. It won't just be potentially mm -hmm. in the hands of a, of a king from Judah. There will be an actual king from Judah on the throne once the Messiah comes. Meaning that Jewish history has been a history where we've had ups and downs. And mm -hmm. the whole idea of the Messianic kingdom is one in which all the promises to the Jewish people are being fulfilled, and there's no more ups and downs after that. It's all up. And so all the passage is really saying is, you know, the most we could extract from it is that, yes, there will be this fulfilled promise to Judah in that he will have a king on the throne, which is the Messiah, and that will never go away. And so really, at the end of the day, all this passage is saying is that the Messiah will come one day. That's all it really yep. would be saying, and... You know, so it's only helpful to, to the case for Jesus if we just assume, you know, at the outset that he was the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, then of course any passage which speaks about the Messiah must be speaking about him. But again, that's backwards thinking, meaning that that's going from Revelation back to Genesis. And mm. in a normal court case, in a hearing, if we're trying to determine, you know, is Jesus the Messiah or not, so we're beginning from the Bible, and we're trying to evaluate Jesus. All this is saying is the Messiah will come one day. It doesn't at, at, in any way point to Jesus. And so that's it really... Doesn't say, yeah, it doesn't say until Yeshua comes. It says until Shiloh comes, and that's rather obscure. Even if now it said not, until Yeshua comes. I mean, it's not as if there aren't other people in the world that have that Yeshua. Name. Absolutely uh, right. You know, and we jumped from we jumped from fifteen to sixteen, and sixteen says, uh, taking from Genesis forty nine ten, the seed of Judah, meaning as you've just pointed out, that there will always be a king available that will come from the tribe of Judah, and uh, and it cites Luke three thirty three, which is the uh, the genealogy of Jesus, right? And it does say in the genealogy that uh, this is Joseph's genealogy that uh, he is of the tribe of Judah. That, that's correct? Yeah, th I mean, this is obviously a can of worms for the, for the case for Jesus here because, again, this particular uh, proof now is saying that the Messiah will be someone from the seed of Judah, which is perfectly true. Um, the two problems would be, number one, you know, it would be like, it would be like someone trying to say that uh, I can identify a criminal at Harvard University What's the identification? It's someone that wearing glasses. And obviously, <laughs> it could apply to you know hundreds and thousands of people. So to say that you know the Messiah will be from the seed of Judah, well, that can apply potentially to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It doesn't pinpoint Jesus. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that, and, and you know, the New Testament has two passages which encourages Christians not to delve too deeply into genealogy. Because it's a bit of a, a quagmire. I mean, this idea that the the the, the genealogy or the the um, the family line in the Hebrew Bible always goes through the father. It's Numbers chapter mm -hmm. one, It goes through the house mm -hmm. of the father, and uh, the the Christian Bible in Luke chapter three and Matthew chapter one basically trace Joseph all the way back to King David, and then all mm -hmm. the way back to Judah. But they insist that Joseph was not connected to Jesus, um, insisting that Jesus didn't have an earthly father. So, I mean, this is, uh, for me, not a very productive discussion, but the Christian Bible, no, no, seems, right. to, uh, seems, the Christian Bible seems to shoot it's, itself it's, in the foot. It's self-defeating in this particular uh, uh, instance because, um, as you say, it's very odd that both Matthew and Luke that have genealogies of Jesus, they're different, but they're, apparently they're both Joseph's, and... Uh, they both uh, also have the virgin birth story. So why do we care what Joseph's uh, genealogy is? And yet uh, they will also say that, oh, but he's from the tribe of Judah. Have a look at Joseph's genealogy. It goes, it's a little bit um, unfortunate. And, and it just so happens in Luke that Luke 
if I remember correctly, misses out on a, on a very important ingredient in, in the genealogy for a, a messianic candidate. That, of course, is Solomon. And, uh, and that brings me to 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verses 12 to 14, which very clearly states that not only shall the, um, the messianic candidate be a, a descendant of David, of the, of the tribe of Judah, but also a descendant of Solomon. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And so, you know, the, the, the best uh, case scenario here for Christianity is that the Bible is telling us that the Messiah comes from the line of Judah, this from the seed of Judah, and that they can claim that, yes, Jesus comes from Judah. And I, I'm willing to uh, imagine that could be possibly true. But again, it doesn't lead us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah just because he comes from the tribe of Judah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's a prerequisite, but not a real qualification. Meaning, it's not an identifier. So no, it, not would an be, identifier. it would be like saying yeah. the Messiah has to be human. Jesus was human, therefore yeah, must right. be the Messiah. The Messiah. He was born, he was human, must be the Messiah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's not really what we're looking for. It's not, a, it's not really identifying information. When we're trying to find that criminal at Harvard University, someone that has hair or someone that wears glasses, that's really not what we're looking for. We're looking for some specific identifying information that Absolutely. would not apply to other people. Well, there's two more that, uh, that, w that are supposedly found in Genesis 49.10. Number 18 of the list, uh, to come before Judah, to come before Judah lost identity. I, I don't, do you know where this is going? They're, they're citing John I think, 11. I think this I, is really double dipping. I think that this is sort of harking back to the first one where there was an assumption that, you know, uh, somehow the, the kingship will be cut off. And they're sort of now saying that it's not just the kingship, but it's Judah. Uh, maybe the, the whole tribe of Judah loses its entity. It's, it's very unclear what they're getting at here. What they're getting at, that's terribly nebulous. Maybe some of uh, the listeners might have an idea. You can leave it in the comments section. Genesis 49.10 is what we're looking at. And number 19 says, to him shall the obedience of the people be. And they're citing John 10.16. Uh, comments? <laughs> this is interesting because this is something that is entirely true about the Messiah, meaning that we do believe that the Messiah will be uh, king of the Jewish people and that certainly the Jewish people will be obedient to him, but really the uh, uh, effect, the, the, um, the career of the Messiah will be to have a universal global impact. And so to speak about the fact that to this character to Shiloh will be the obedience of the people, we believe indeed that's true. Um, we believe that the Messiah will have some kind of dominion or rulership over the entire world. Um, the problem is, again, that this was not manifested in the life of Jesus. And what's really fascinating, when we go through this list of 365 passages, we're going to see that whenever we hit upon an actual messianic prophecy, a real messianic prophecy, Christians are forced to put that off until the second coming of Jesus. Meaning that what's interesting about this list is that among those 365, they're going to hit a dozen or so actual prophecies about the Messiah. This is mm -hmm. one of them. And what this is saying is that this Messiah will be a, a king over the entire world, will have universal dominion. But Jesus didn't rule over anyone. Jesus didn't rule over the Jewish people. He had no political authority and no real temporal rulership over not even his mm -hmm. own people, but certainly not over the world, Certain didn't, certainly didn't rule over the Roman government, which executed him. So what Christians are forced to say is that, yes, when Jesus returns in the millennial kingdom, then he will have dominion over all the people. So mm. what's fascinating is that every single time we are going to hit on this list an actual messianic prophecy... Christians will be forced to say, well, that will happen in the future when Jesus returns. But the question will be then, so why believe in him now? Meaning that if every messianic prophecy will only be fulfilled at some potential time in the future when Jesus returns, but why should we give him loyalty now? Meaning that uh, there's no reason to, you know, I, I could say really about any failed messiah that they'll fulfill all of the messianic prophecies when they return. When they come back. Yeah, yeah I could say that my grandfather was the messiah. 
and and, and yeah, and, and, and anything that he hasn't fulfilled, he'll do it when he gets back. Exactly. So but then you could, now, there is actually an, an example. We I mean we brushed over eighteen because we're not too sure what they meant on eighteen. Um, but the uh, the passage that they cite is John eleven uh, forty seven to fifty two, and I mean in the in verse um, uh, fifty one and fifty two. Well, first fifty two it says. Uh, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Now, that hasn't happened yet. And if you, I, I, I suppose, uh, Rabbi, if you were to take that up with a Christian, they'll say, well, that'll happen when he comes back. Precisely. Which, again, look, anyone has the right to believe that. Um, I, I don't begrudge anyone the right to believe what they want to believe, but they're trying to, we have to understand what their enterprise is here. They're trying to make the claim that if uh, a person were to read the Hebrew Scriptures with an open mind and open eyes and open heart, they will see clearly that it, it points to Jesus as the Messiah. And what really happens is that the Christian is forced to say, no, there's really nothing that points to him. You've got to accept him by faith. But when he comes back, he'll fulfill all of the prophecies about the um, Messiah's coming. Mm -hmm. and so I suppose uh, we're going to see that, uh, that that's going to happen uh, quite often, I suppose, as we go through. Not that often, actually, because in this True. entire list, there will only be about uh, 10 or 15 of these passages that are actually yes. talking about the Messiah. Now, the next one, well, we have to conclude that uh, the book of Genesis, at least according to this list, uh, is not compelling us to go to church on Sunday. We're now going to go to the book of Exodus, where it kicks off Number 20 on the list, Exodus 3, 13 to 14. And this is, as they say on the list, the great I am. And they cite, now you're going to have to help me with this, they cite John 4, 26. I would have thought they would cite John 8. Why would they not be citing John 8? <laughs> I can't answer for that. <laughs> but this is the, I mean, isn't that the one? I mean, that's the one where, where uh, Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And every, you know, most every Bible that I've ever read capitalizes I am to uh, to to uh, assert something uh, certainly, and you know all all um, uh, reference Bibles, Christian reference Bibles that I've had a look at, always point back to Exodus three thirteen to fourteen because this is of course where Moses says to God, uh, well God says to Moses, I am who I am, and He said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So I think they could have probably done a better job here. Um, in terms of this, the proof text that they're pointing to in the Christian scriptures, um, but let, let's let's uh, just analyze. We could this. have done a we could have done a better. Job I think we could have done a better job. We, if we, we wanted to this be the devil's advocate, I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I read this uh, passage in, in uh, Christian Bibles, it reminds me of Popeye when I was growing up, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, it's really may it may not be the, the most accurate translation. Um, you know, the Hebrew eh, yeah, is, is really future tense. I will be what I will be. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because when we think about the context of what's going on here, you know, God is sending Moses to redeem the Jewish people. And he says to Moses, you'll go down to the Jewish people and tell them that, you know, the Lord God will be taking you out of Egypt. And Moses immediately asks a very peculiar question. You know, you, know, you would think that he's going to say to God, you know, that the Jewish people may challenge me. How is, how is this God going to do that? You know, it seems like an impossible task. But the one question that Moses seems to be immediately bothered by is he says to God, well, what if they ask me your name? Which seems to be a sort of a peculiar question to be wondering about. But really in the Bible, um, names always uh, describe uh, the essence of something. Mm -hmm. A name is, is uh, what something is. And when God, when Moses asks God here, you know, you're telling me to go to the Jewish people and, and tell them that God is going to redeem you, and Moses wants to know, what should I tell them if they ask me your name? Really, what Moses is asking is, what if they ask me, who is this God? Who, who are you talking about? You know, a name, you know, I don't think it's simply a matter of Moses coming back and saying it was Fred or it was Bob or it was Joe. <laughs> I, I think that what they're asking really is, tell us about this God. We want to mm -hmm. understand who this God is. And so God says, because we know the Bible has many names for God. So at this point, God says to Moses, I will be what I will be. And that's my name. And he's saying, that's what you should tell them. And really, it answers the question, because 
it's not enough if God just said a, a name. What does that really tell you about God? But here, what God is actually saying is to the Jewish people, you want to know who I am? I will be what I will be. What God is really mm -hmm. saying is, you will see. You will walk with me on the stage of history. I will reveal myself to you in the way I interact with you as a people. And that's how you will understand me. It's not, you're not going to learn that much if I tell you my name is uh, Elohim. What is that really telling you? But mm -hmm. God is saying to them, if you want to understand me, walk with me, experience me. And God is really saying, you'll see. You'll see who I am. I'll make it very clear to you, uh, you know, as we go through this together. So God is saying, I will be what I will be. You'll experience and in the, me. In this description, this is in no way some sort of messianic prophecy. Oddly enough, uh, in this list, uh, they've cited John 4, 26. This is Jesus talking to the woman at the well. Uh, and the woman at the well says um, in verse 25 of John 4, uh, I know that the Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us, uh, all things, and Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And now, I don't know how they can possibly join those two passages together as if they have significance to each other. Here, Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah, check it out. Ha, you're talking to him, good one. But in, uh, in, in Exodus 3, uh, God is speaking to Moses, answering his question. The two are not connected in any way, am I fair? Is it, right. is it fair in saying that? And I think what you said Very earlier was true, that when you read Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 3, again, in context, this is not a passage about the Messiah. Uh, Nothing to do with it. No, and again, even if it were, it doesn't necessarily point to Jesus. As a matter of fact, what's interesting, there's a famous story where uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was a trial lawyer, uh, once asked someone uh, in a trial, he said, if you were to say that uh, the jackal's tail was a leg, how many legs would it have? So the fellow said, five. So Lincoln says, no, calling it a leg doesn't make it a leg. It only has four legs. And so <laughs> the fact that Jesus says, I am, right, even if that was God's name. So God says, I am what I am, if that's the translation, which it probably isn't. But for Jesus to later say at some point, you know, and uh, I am, th that would be, let's say he was saying, I am God. So just because a certain person says they're God doesn't mean they're God. Um, mm. it, it's really, uh, again, a, a very, very uh, weak kind of proof because, uh, you know, it's almost like saying, you know, uh, we have to take this as truth because I say so. You know, how do, yeah. how do we know? Because we say so. I mean, it, <laughs> it almost boils down to that, you know, Jesus must be the Messiah, not because the Hebrew scriptures say so, but because the New Testament says so. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not a good start to Exodus so far. So that's, uh, that's number 20. Um, we, we, it, gets, it gets juicier, though. We, we get into uh, number 21, Exodus 12, 5. And Exodus 12, 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male in the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. This, of course, is the lamb uh, that was sacrificed on Pesach. Uh, the blood was uh, applied to the doorpost. Now, let me ask you a question, Rabbi Michael Skovac. If Oddly enough, if I had decided to circumcise my lamb circumcise would that have been without your lamb yeah if i for whatever reason i decide i'm going to circumcise my lamb would that be a, a lamb without blemish <laughs> i see where you're going with this because well, because well, think well, paul, well, paul refers to circumcision as mutilation uh, i think it's in full well, if i if i had i mean let's be let's be a bit clear if i had whipped my lamb could I, I mean, is that a lamb without blemish? Right, if you whipped it, if you put a crown of thrones on its head, if you stuck a spear in its side, if you beat it, you know, it mercilessly, you beat it if you couldn't use it, right? It. Yeah, th that's a good point that, you know, Jewish law in terms of an unblemished animal was quite strict. You know, they had to t actually take the lamb for four days and separate it and sort of keep it away from everything to make sure it doesn't become blemished. And uh, even a nick on the animal, any kind of a scratch or a nick, would render it blemished. Um, you know, blemish doesn't mean in the Bible that someone takes a, a big three-gallon pail of paint and throws it on the animal. Um, blemishes in the Bible refer to normally some kind of a physical uh, marring. And it could be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a cut, a nick, a scratch. Um, it couldn't be used. And so... Uh, it's very difficult to say that Jesus is the unblemished lamb when, you know, he had a pretty rough treatment before he finally dies. 
Um, and your point about circumcision is, is quite good because, as I mentioned, Paul, in the book of having Philippians, refers to the circumcision as mutilation. Um, mm. So someone that's mutilated, you couldn't call them without blemish. Um, now, they're, they're citing, of course, First Peter uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 19. Uh, I'm just going to read from 18 because it says, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. I've, have you ever seen gold corrupt? I don't have much gold in my hand. I've never seen gold corrode. Anyway, moving on. Uh, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Now, when it, when it came to redeeming, uh, usually silver was used, right? I mean, this is uh, we find this in the Torah. Yes. Uh, but, but according to Peter, this, this is uh, aimless conduct by tradition of the fathers. But he goes on to say, with, uh, we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So obviously he's speaking metaphorically, but you know this is <laughs> this is in, in reality this is just not the case. Yeah, and again the 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 formula that we saw is very important here. That if you had picked up the Bible, you know, two hundred years before the Common Era, you know, in the time of the Maccabees, or if you picked up the Bible in the time of Jeremiah, and you were to read this passage in Exodus, would you really have thought that this verse, which speaks about you know, the lamb that was brought as a sacrifice, not only really a sacrifice, it was just brought to, to slaughter the lamb and take the blood and wipe it on the doorposts. Mm. Um, would you have thought that this is telling us about the coming of the Messiah? Oh, and yeah. even if you would, for some strange reason, maybe you took too much drugs that day, but <laughs> how would that help you know who the Messiah would be? Meaning that, again, the, the, the real problem is that it's not really a, a passage about the Messiah, and even if it were, it wouldn't really point to anyone in particular. Um, mm. it, it's sort of useless. It doesn't really, you know, get off the ground in so many mm. ways. So th the real question here, which is the question that has to be asked for each one of these 365, is, is this passage in Exodus, in truth, really a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah? Mm -hmm. Or is it just something that when Christians look back on the Bible... They're able to say, oh, we can say that this somehow has some parallels to Jesus. I mm. mean, that's not how a trial works. In a, in a trial, you want to examine the evidence and see it points to a particular direction. And I don't think that it's possible in reading Exodus 12 to say that it's very clear that this is evidence which describes who the Messiah will be. Well, they've got a few more uh, stabs at uh, Exodus chapter 12, and the next one, number 22, apparently is found in Exodus 12, 13. It says, the blood of the Lamb saves Romans' wrath. Now, I don't understand where they're going here. They're citing Romans 3, 8. I don't understand. That they, they seem to be thinking that uh, the blood of the Lamb uh, saved them from uh, the wrath of the Romans. But if you go to Romans 1, 18, I think it is, it's very, it's very clearly talking about the wrath of God. Nevertheless, how is this in any way a messianic prophecy? Well, what's interesting, by the way, is that th this uh, sacrifice in Exodus 12 wasn't a uh, all-purpose uh, salvation, you know, to save the entire world or even the entire Jewish people. The only people that were endangered at that time were the firstborn males. Sure. Um, you know, the angel of death was going to come to, you know, this plague, the last of the ten plagues, was going to kill the firstborn males. Um, so the putting the blood on the doorpost was not to redeem or save every single person. It was just basically to um, save the firstborn. And again, you know, this is a passage, if you were to sit down with a Bible a hundred years before Christianity, you would not have imagined at all that this was something that had to do with the Messiah. Mm. Um, it's interesting, by the way, also, that, um, you know, the lamb here uh, was actually uh, venerated and worshipped um, by the Egyptians, by the Egyptians um, which is what Christians Allah. do. Christians do that with Jesus. They, they, they do exactly. They worship the lamb, but God didn't tell us to worship the lamb. God actually told us to slaughter the lamb. And that's what the Jews did. That, that, that you know, that part of what is going on here, you know, is that this is not just a uh, arbitrary 
um, symbol that God chose to use. Meaning that if God wanted us to put some kind of a symbol on our doorposts, you know, as a way to identify the house of people who, you know, should not be killed in this plague, um, there are many things we could have put on our doorposts. But here, God was having us do something that was an act of bravery. I mean, you think about it, you know, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 8 that the Egyptians really venerated the lambs, and it was, uh, they were holy to the Egyptians. You know, mm. the month of April was the, the, the uh, sign, the astrological sign is a sign of the Aries of the lamb, and, uh, you know, this is a very special animal among the Egyptians, and God tells the Jewish people, take this really is God of the Egyptians. They worship many different things, but they were to take this thing that was venerated by the Egyptians, tie it to their bedposts for four days. Now, imagine you would do that. You know, it'd be like going into, you know, the United States and taking an American flag and somehow, you know, tearing it up and burning it. That would be mm. seen as very provocative. So it would be seen as, a, as an abomination. Oh, yeah. Them. I that mean, th th it would have been uh, a world war would break out. And mm -hmm. so here the Jews would take this uh, animal which is venerated by the Egyptians and then tie it to the doorposts and if anyone was going to come and say well what are you tying it up for and they would say well in four days we're going to kill these things we're going to slaughter them that's very provocative and it's a statement by the Jewish people that we are rejecting the idolatry of this foreign nation and so in some way this is very paradoxical that Christians have seized upon uh, the, the symbol in the wrong way, meaning that this, the, the Christian here worships this lamb, which was a symbol of idolatry. The Jews were told to actually take it and slaughter it. Um, so if, if we want to think about this in symbolic terms, um, it's not very helpful to the case for Christianity. Not at all. So we are now, now the, number 23, Exodus 12, 21 to 27, uh, they say Christ is our power server, they cite 1 Corinthians 5, 7, um, I think we've covered that, right? <laughs> well, I would say one more thing about this, by the way. I, 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 yeah. I'm always bothered by this, that um, the Bible says that, f at least for males to participate in the Passover ritual, they have to be circumcised in the flesh. And as far as I understand, Christianity never put a lot of stock in uh, the importance mm. of getting circumcised. I mean, you have certainly mm. many passages in the Bible where Paul especially um, doesn't speak positively about circumcision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's one very, you know, horrible passage where he speaks about his wish that the Jews who were circumcising themselves would slip and castrate themselves. Yeah, um, and then he says in, in one place that you know those who take upon themselves circumcision, Jesus will be of no benefit to them. You know, so mm -hmm. it's interesting that th throughout Christian history. Um, at least for you know most of Christian history, Christians didn't see uh, getting circumcised in, in the flesh as something that was important to do. As a matter of fact, you know they would refer to the Jews, at least in the Christian scriptures, derisively as those of the circumcision. You know, mm. the Jews are those of the circumcision. Certainly, Christians didn't see themselves that way. At least the people that followed Paul, and here. You know, what the Bible is saying is that if you want to be somehow part of this Passover ritual, circumcision is a critical prerequisite. You have to be hmm. circumcised. Uh, very, very clear. Yeah. So now, before we leave the uh, uh, the Pesach narrative of Exodus chapter 12, uh, the last one that they cite, number 24 on the list, Exodus 12, 46, not a bone of the lamb to be broken. And they say that this is a messianic for, um, prophecy fulfilled in John chapter 19, verses 31 to 36. I'd like if you could comment on, uh, in particular, uh, verse 36 of John, because what happens is, of course, the Romans are saying, oh, it's getting late, over this, go and break the, the bones, go and break the legs, so that these guys just suffocate and die, they'll be dead. And they get to Jesus, he's already dead. Uh, so they don't break his legs, and it says, but these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled not one of his bones shall, shall be broken. I always found that to be peculiar um, because uh, I remember uh, I had a discussion once with uh, a Christian who was telling me that uh, in order to be forgiven for your sins, you have to have a blood sacrifice. And, you know, they were challenging me, where is your blood sacrifice? Where is your blood? And, uh, I, you know, I was just joking around, but I was sort of half serious. I said, well, you know what? 
Um, last night I was making uh, my sandwich for the next day. I was preparing my lunch for the next day. And the knife slipped, and I cut my finger, and my finger bled on the kitchen floor. <laughs> and I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> There's been the shedding of blood, and my sins have been forgiven. Because, you know, the Christians like to point to Leviticus 17.11 and says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And I said, you know, I had blood shed and my sins are forgiven. So this fellow looked at me and said, what are you talking about? You just can't make up your own religion. The Bible has laws of sacrifices and cutting your finger, you know, and having the blood drip on the kitchen floor does not really qualify as, uh, you know, a sacrifice. So I said, oh, so you're saying that there were laws of sacrifices, and they had to be done in a certain way. He said, of course. Well, I said, well, that's going to present a problem for Christianity, because sacrifices in the Bible had to be offered by a priest. You know, not Roman soldiers wouldn't have qualified. And mm -hmm. as we men mentioned before, sacrifices had to be without blemish. Jesus had blemishes. Sacrifices were all burnt. They had to be burnt. Jesus was not burnt. Um, sacrifices had to be brought in Leviticus 17, on the altar and not on some cross on a hill. So I said, if you go through, you know, you're telling me that cutting my finger is not uh, effective because it doesn't follow the laws of the sacrifices. I said, well, Jesus didn't really fulfill any of the laws of the sacrifices. So at this point, he looked at me um, sort of angrily and you know, he said, well, you Jews, you know, you're anal retentive and you're so hung up with the letter of the law and you know, so that, you know, every little thing. He says, I don't understand. You know, you're blind to the truth. He said that Jesus was not a literal sacrifice. He was a spiritual sacrifice. I mean, he was saying, don't get so caught up with the details and the nitty gritty of the laws of sacrifices. He says, you're, you're making a mistake. He says, it was not a literal sacrifice. It was, a, it was a spiritual figurative sacrifice. So I said, well, that's interesting because here the book of John tells this whole amazing story that, you know, Jesus is crucified on a Friday. You know, two other people are there with him. And, uh, you know, normally... You know, because the Romans are so sweet and righteous, they wouldn't want, God forbid, someone to be hanging on the cross over the Sabbath. So if they weren't dead before the Sabbath, they would break their legs so that they would expire quickly on the cross. But they, John says, but, but, but they got to Jesus, you know, he was already dead, and they didn't have to break his legs. And he says, and therefore, they, that, was, that fulfilled that which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, saying, not a bone of him shall be broken. So I said, it seems pretty clear that to John, at least, the fulfillment of the law literally was important. You know, so you can't have it both ways. I mean, that you can't either, have it both ways. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's one of the conundrums that that they will face here. That is something that uh, that I want listeners to take note of and uh, really dwell on that and give it some thought because, uh, again, verse 36 of John 19, it says, These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall broken. If it's good enough for one part of the Torah, for one law of the Torah, why is it not good enough for the rest? I mean, putting aside the fact that Jesus is a human being, not a kosher animal, putting aside the fact that uh, after he died, he was bled. Uh, I mean, there is, there's a list as long as my arm as to what was done incorrectly and, and how very incorrectly it was. Uh, and yet here we are saying that this had to be, his bones had to be uh, preserved so that the Torah would be fulfilled something to consider uh, and give a lot of thought to. The yeah, next I one... Think by the way, just, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but again, I think that the real question is, is this passage a messianic prophecy? Meaning, is this passage really, when we read it, is this really God trying to tell us, you know, clearly how we'll be able to identify the Messiah? And the truth is that Exodus 12, 46, it's not a messianic prophecy. And again, you know, it wouldn't specifically point to Jesus anyway, because, uh, uh, you know, th there's no proof that it's really about him in particular. He's not a lamb. It's very, very simple. Number 25, Exodus 13, 2. Um, oh, boy. Blessing to the firstborn? <laughs> You don't seem bowled over by that one. Oh, they're, they're getting hard. Okay, so it says, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. How is this a messianic prophecy? <laughs> I mean, again, again, they, they go to the, uh, I think it's the birth narrative in, in Luke, if I'm not mistaken. And so we all agree that Jesus was born, but how does that make him a messianic prophecy? 
Well, it's not, and I think that really the 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 mistake here is that the, what the passage says is that this firstborn is mine. God said it's mine, but what it doesn't say is that it's me. I mean, that the way the Christian is reading it is that somehow this the firstborn is somehow alluding to God Himself, that Jesus is God because Jesus is the firstborn, and uh, the the verse does not say that the firstborn is me. It says it belongs to God. Um, and uh, I think that we would agree that all human beings belong to God. Everything that was mm -hmm. created belongs to God, and that would include Jesus as well. Uh, you know, there's the Creator, and there's everything else. And everything that's not the Creator is created. And uh, that applies to Jesus as well as to every other human being, that, that we're not the Creator's. We belong to God. Mm -hmm. Here we find ourselves in number 20, 26 of the list, Exodus 15, 2. This is the song of Moses, and it says, The Lord is my strength and my song, uh, and he has become my salvation. Now, it doesn't say the Lord. It says Yah. Now, is it, are they trying to derive something from here? I don't know. It says Yah is my strength and song. He has become my salvation and is my God, and I will praise him uh, my Father's God, I will exalt him. Now, according to this list, his uh, exaltation predicted as Yeshua. C can you help me out? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the the attractive part of this for the Christian is that it has the name or the word Yeshua, which they believe is the Hebrew name for Jesus. So um, what they're claiming here is that uh, the exaltation of God is predicted as Yeshua. Somehow they're... they're they're, they're reading into this passage the name uh, ah, of Yeshua. So it's saying, Jesus. He has become my Yeshua. Yeah. That's what it's saying. Now, okay. <laughs> the problem here um, is interesting that, you know, it was often said that Christianity and Judaism have the same uh, vocabulary list. We have the same uh, list of words that we share, but we're a very different uh, definition of what they mean. And the word salvation in the Christian Bible, I think one of the first times it comes up is in Matthew one twenty one, where it says that his name will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Hmm. And th this is really the way in which Christians see the word salvation, is that it, it deals with um, redeeming someone in a spiritual way. Um, it has to do with being freed and, and rescued from your sin, and basically to become spiritually uh, elevated. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's basically seen in a very spiritual way in the Christian uh, scriptures. And it's interesting that in the Hebrew scriptures, it's invariably speaking about um, something in the political and physical realm. Um, it's interesting that right before this verse, Exodus 15.2, it says that God saved the Israelites from the Egyptians. Mm. Same exact word in Hebrew, you know, Yeshua, Vayesha, Vayosha. So, the, this root word, this root of salvation, to save, in the Hebrew Bible, if you just look up every single time it appears, you know, Deuteronomy speaks about the woman who's in the field and someone's attacking her and there's no one to save her. Or throughout mm -hmm. the book of Judges, there were enemies that rose up against the Jewish people and God rose up saviors to save them from the hands of their enemies. Yes. So, mm -hmm. The, the, the word in Hebrew really is invariably speaking about God stepping in, not even God, by the way, there are times when humans act as the agents to save others, but, mm -hmm. it, but the salvation is operating in a more physical realm, and it's really very different than the Christian understanding that somehow it speaks about a, a spiritual re rescue or redemption. So here, mm -hmm. the passage is very clear that it's speaking about the um, God being praised here, from rescuing the Jewish people from but, their but delivering them from, Absolutely. Yeah, not, very, very not really much to do about the coming of the Messiah. There's no prediction here. There's no uh, future prediction about anything having to do with the Messiah or anyone else for that matter. It's a song that was sung at a particular time in history about the redemption that took place at that time. And yet it continues, uh, verse 11 of the same song of Moses, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fear, uh, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Well, that seems pretty clear to me. I mean, if I read that, 
I think, well, of course, he's, he's just brought them out of Egypt with, with mighty works, with an outstretched arm, with a, a amazing uh, miracles, the, the crossing of the Dead Sea, and all, all, all of these, uh, the Red Sea, crossing of the Red Sea, all of these things, uh, it seems it's very straightforward that, um, that in the song that Moses is praising God for, uh, for his uh, gl glorious uh, holiness and so on and so forth, and yet here in number 27 of the list, Exodus 15:11. His character and holiness somehow is a messianic prophecy. Well, again, you know, this basically is, is a pattern that we're going to see where um, it's basically a passage that speaks about God, very clearly speaking about God's mm. character here. It's, a, it's really a song of praise to God who took them out of Egypt. Um, and uh, really the, the, the formula that the Christian is using here is to say, well, when it speaks about God, that's speaking about Jesus, because Jesus is God. Um, so, you know, it's very easy to see how the Christian is able to go back to this passage and say, oh, here's a passage speaking about the holiness of God, and that certainly, they believe, refers to Jesus as well, because they see him as God. He must be holy. Um, but again, it only works if you accept at the outset the Christian assumption that Jesus was God and Jesus is holy. Um, the, the real question is, how do you get from Exodus 15:11? to Jesus. Um, it's not mm. clearly a messianic prophecy here. Um, it's basically simply speaking about the nature of God. Um, That's right. All right, so we move on. Number 28. We're still in Exodus. We've got two more to go. Let's see if we can finish Exodus. Number 28 is Exodus 17.6. Now, this one does have... Uh, it, it takes us to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. The spiritual rock of Israel. And in verse 4 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says... And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that uh, followed them. There's a rock that was following them in the desert. How about that? And uh, and that rock, that rock, Michael, that rock was Christ. There you go, going to church on Sunday. Yeah, you know, I, I look at this one and I say to myself, uh, oi, I <laughs> say oi. Um, <laughs> oi, oi. You know, I, I, I imagine if I was in a courtroom and, uh, you know, let's say Jesus hired a lawyer, to convince the jury that he was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And if the lawyer trotted out this passage in Exodus 17, 6, you know, and uh, claimed that this is, you know, some of his best evidence to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, you know, I think that his license to practice law would be revoked. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's just... I think, I think also probably a drug test would be in order. I mean, it's really, it's so remote. It is so... Uh, you know, you know, the, the, the you have to really, uh, you know, do this incredible dance uh, to somehow connect this passage um, in Exodus 17 uh, and to say that yes, um, it's bizarre because what it says is uh, the Lord said to Moses, "Go before the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, taking your hand your rod uh, w with which you struck the river." And go, and behold, I will stand before you, and, and there on the rock in, in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and drink, uh, and water, water will come out of it, and people will, may drink. Now, um, this, according to uh, 1 Corinthians, this is a rock that followed them around in the desert. It's not a real rock, as it seems to be in Exodus 17, 3. It's some sort of spiritual rock, and, uh, and, and in fact, it was some sort of uh, Jesus pre-incarnated as a rock. This is what it's saying, right? Yeah, and if I was in that courtroom, I would turn to this lawyer... <laughs> and I would say, why in the world are you imagining that this passage has anything to do with the Messiah? I mean, that, that we're reading here a narrative where, you know, the Jews are thirsty and Moses takes a, ro a rod and strikes the rock. I mean, it, 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 it seems to be pretty clear what's going on in that passage. <laughs> and why in the world would anyone e even imagine that, oh, obviously, here... The Bible is giving us very critical information about the Messiah who will come one day. I mean, that it, it, it seems to be totally disconnected. It seems almost impossible to go from point A to point B. It seems that, you know, you have to have a tremendous imagination to somehow read this chapter in Exodus and, and think that, oh yeah, it seems pretty clear that what God is communicating to us here 
is very pertinent information to help us one day identify who the Messiah is. I mean, it, it's yeah. so difficult. And again, you know, it's got two problems. You know, the, the biggest problem is that it literally has nothing to do with the topic of the Messiah. And number two, even if a person for some reason lost their senses and was going to say, yes, it's pretty clear to me, it's about the Messiah, but then it doesn't necessarily point to Jesus. That's it, mm. It's all, basically, it only works, it only works if you just assume at the outset Jesus was the Messiah. And then you can somehow, even from there, to go back, and so why, but why tie that back to Moses hitting a rock? It requires incredible imaginative uh, powers to somehow make that leap. Certainly very abstract. The last one in the book of Exodus, number 29 on the list, Exodus 33, 19, and it says, it does say, then he said, uh, okay, so this is Moses saying, please show me your glory. And, he, and, and God said to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What a great verse. That is such a great verse. Uh, and uh, this apparently is a messianic fulfillment according to uh, this list, 365 messianic fulfillments that Jesus supposedly fulfilled uh, his character and mercy. Now, I guess, Michael, what it's saying is that, well, we believe that Jesus was, um, uh, he was very merciful. Therefore, when God passed before Moses with his goodness and his compassion, that's a messianic prophecy. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what it's saying. You don't right? seem that, convinced. Um, well, no, I'm just trying to make sense. I'm honestly trying to do the best with it that I can. Well, but, uh, uh, you know, this is what led me last week to say that, you know, if I was given the assignment, you know, by these people to put together a list, I wouldn't have stopped at 365. Meaning that once, you know, you're pointing to something like this, what they're really doing is they're saying, here's a statement about God. That's what this is about. This is a statement about God's nature, saying God is merciful. So, really, I would go to every single verse in the Bible that says anything about God, and that then becomes somehow pointing to Jesus, meaning that I would extract thousands and thousands of prophecies if I was using this criteria. Um, mm. Exodus 33 is, again, you know, revealing to us the nature of the Almighty. And, uh, mm. you know, it, again, requires an incredible leap of imagination to somehow say, yeah, well, I guess that proves that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, to somehow apply that also and say that this is relevant also to Jesus because, of course, in Isaiah it says, uh, God says, I will not share my glory with another. Fair? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the amount of evidence that we have that, you know, uh, you know would, would lead us not to believe that uh, Jesus was God is, is immense. But just in terms of analyzing this verse in Exodus, um, you know, th there's no reason for a person to sit down and assume this is making a prediction about the Messiah who will one day come. Um, mm. You know, it's interesting that um, the truth is that, you know, throughout Jewish history, there have been many, many people, both Jews and non-Jews, who you could call merciful. Um, it wouldn't be that Jesus had mm. a monopoly on being merciful. On, on mercy, that's right. <laughs> and, you know, if I, if I accept the gospel stories at face value, you know, he's often not very merciful. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, he seems to have very little patience for anyone that dares to question, you know, his claims about himself. I Meaning he made very um, bold claims that, you know, I'm the Messiah, uh, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, everyone has a right to, to think that they may be the Messiah, but to expect people to accept that claim uncritically and then to have very harsh words for them, um, you know, to speak about them in the kind of ways Jesus does, is not what I would call merciful, meaning that a, mm. a more patient, a tolerant uh, person would have tried to help people understand why uh, he was who he claimed to be. And mm -hmm. uh, he seems to be someone who, you know, in some stories exhibits mercy. Um, but again, uh, uh, most of the people I know in my life exhibit mercy at certain times in their life. Of and uh, so we know that, that God doesn't just 
occasionally uh, act with mercy. God's very nature, we're being told here, his character is mm. merciful. And, mm. uh, I mean, I think that's the, the uh, impact, that's really what, what this passage in Exodus is teaching us, is that if we want to understand the essence of God, uh, the essence of God is, is chesed, is mercy, is compassion, uh, goodness, yeah. I, I think that mm. you know the, the on a theological you know level, you know it leads to you know the the big sixty four thousand dollar question about all religious faith is that if that's really at the end of the day the nature of God, you know how do we understand suffering? You know how does a merciful, compassionate, loving God allow mm. so much suffering in the world? And that's you know there are many questions you can ask about religions about faith. This is really the only strong one. Um, it's you know it's a question that's so strong that the Bible devotes an entire book to it. And uh, it's interesting, according to rabbinic tradition, when Moses asks God, you know, show me your ways, you know, show me your glory, show me your ways. He's asking a lot mm. of questions in the Book of Exodus. The the way the Talmud understands that question is that you know what's bothering Moses what does he really want to understand what you know he seems to know a lot about God you know the Bible speaks about him as someone who knew God face to face and spoke to him mm. face to face and was uh, you know so close to God but the Talmud says the one thing that he really didn't understand is why do the righteous suffer and so God you know that's the question that he wants to know from God uh, mm. God says to him that you know you can never understand that question. He says, you cannot see me and live, meaning that, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't see me in the sense to visually perceive God. It's to, it's saying to see in the sense that we say, oh, I see what you mean. I mean, it's really a way of saying, you can't understand me because you're a living being. You're a mortal, finite, living being. Mm -hmm. You cannot understand a entirely spiritual, transcendent God. You, you, mm -hmm. It's something which is not, it would be like trying to explain to your dog why you love Beethoven. A human being cannot, <laughs> we can't understand the mind of God, right? My thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. And yep. uh, some philosopher once said, if I knew God, I would be God. So that's what God says to Moses. Look, you, you really think you can understand? And that was the answer, by the way, he gave to Eov, to Job. You know, the whole mm -hmm. book of Job was about, you know, why people suffer. And God says, well, what do you know about running a world? Did you ever bring forth a sunset? Did you ever... That's true. So, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we have difficulty understanding, you know, suffering in this world, but the Bible is telling us that at the end of the day, God is character is merciful. Mm -hmm. and, and that's and that's what it, that's what uh, Exodus thirty three nineteen. That whole uh, passage is uh, oh, it's, an, it's an amazing passage. I would encourage readers, uh, listeners to read that through again. But in some sort of uh, form, at least, God is offering reassurance. I think to Moses here in uh, three thirty three nineteen certainly has. <laughs> I don't understand how it can be a, a fulfillment, a messianic fulfillment that Jesus apparently fulfilled. However, uh, it's got to get better from here. Uh, well, Michael, it has to move on from here. I mean, Leviticus is going to blow us away. Oh, the book of Leviticus, it's going to be, we're going to do this in a couple of weeks' time. We'll be back onto this list. And uh, But so far, okay, Genesis and Exodus hasn't helped us out. I, I don't feel like I'm going to church on Sunday. Are you? I can't be there. I have something under the command. <laughs> All right, so we're not compelled. But, but we did, never fear, people, because we're going to pick up from... Uh, the list at number 30. We're going to see if we can move through Leviticus, maybe even numbers. So stay tuned until then. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Rabbi Michael Skobek again. The website is JewsForJudaism.ca. JewsForJudaism.ca. Until next time, be blessed, be set apart by the truth of our Father's Word. Shalom.